day four of our language of empowerment uh, seminar organized by the faculty of english it's my great pleasure to welcome you all uh, and it's my great pleasure also an honor to introduce our speaker today and as you know the speaker is professor valentina ustina so welcome to poznan welcome to the faculty of english and it's a real honor to have you with us all right, so a few words of introduction before we hear the lecture. Um, professor Valentina Ustina is a professor of English philology at Lesa Ukraine Kavol in National University in Ukraine. And she serves there as the chair of English philology department. Her academic focus is in the field of sociolinguistics uh, with a specific emphasis on gender and discourse studies. Her research centers on the relationship between language and social meaning, with a particular interest in analyzing risk discourse. Professor Ustina's significant body of work includes numerous publications and research papers, including her monograph entitled Stance Taking in the English Risk Discourse, published in 2015, and her influential contrib contributions to the understanding of linguistic identity. Um, and risk communication, exemplified by her uh, 2020 paper titled From Stance to Identity, Stance Taking Contemporary English Risk Discourse, Cognition Communication Discourse, as well as her recent work uh, from uh, 2022 entitled From Conflict of Discourses to Military Conflict, Multimodality of Identity Construction in Russo-Ukrainian War Discourse, published in East European Journal of Psycholinguistics. Importantly, throughout her career, Professor Ustina has been the recipient of prestigious grants, including the Fulbright Junior Faculty Development Program at the University of Mississippi in Oxford, Mississippi, 19, that was between 1999 and 2000, and the Fulbright Scholar Program at the University of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, between 2019 and 2020. In addition to her academic roles, Professor Ustina actively um, contributes to the field through her membership in professional organizations such as the International Association for the Humanities and the American Society for Linguistic Anthropology. Um, as I said, we're very delighted and honored to have Professor Valentina Ustina with us as speaker in the series. And today she will talk on language of Ukrainian empowerment, discursive construction of national identity in worldview narratives, Please join me in welcoming Professor Valentina Ustina. Thank you very much for such a flattering introduction. So I was listening to it, <laughs> kind of like uh, as if it was not about me. Uh, I'm uh, from Ukraine. I'm uh, from Lutsk, and uh, so. Everybody knows that uh, Ukraine now uh, is fighting uh, a huge war, I would say. And uh, uh, sometimes people are asking me how on earth you can live in Ukraine. So, but we live there and we work there and uh, our students are coming to the university and we have classes offline. Um, at the same time, we do have uh, air raid alerts almost every day. Even today, um, I received uh, a notice on my phone about an air raid. So, but we do have shelters, and uh, so we take our students to shelters. So this is uh, how life is when your country is at war. So you get used to it, and it becomes routine. Um, so today I will uh, talk to you about language and power, about uh, language of empowerment or um, power and language relations. Um, over the past, so I will be using my notes with your permission, at least at the beginning, to uh, to start this talk and uh, to keep to uh, the time uh, plan. So over the past few decades, there has been a growing interest in the analysis of language as a form of social, institutional, and symbolic power. 
moving language out from the domain of lang, uh, where linguistic forms uh, are de decontextualized and idealized into the domain of parole, where language is regarded um, as a socially situated, discursive, and therefore often ideological worldview forming phenomenon. So relations between power and language appear to be in the focus of academic interest more and more often. Researchers question societal problems associated with unequal access to discourse, with asymmetry of uh, language choices, with survival of endangered languages, with aggressive language policies, and language-driven ethnic and national conflicts. The range of uh, questions connecting power to language is so wide that it is impossible to cover all of them in one lecture. So I will focus uh, only on a few of them, such as what is the role and importance of language and discourse in constructing, maintaining, and empowerment of a national identity. So how are the national identities formed and reformed? Why are some nations considered more powerful than others? How do we ex uh, export our national identities abroad? So these and other questions will be uh, on my agenda today. So um, basically uh, my talk will consist of two parts. Firstly, I will speak about discursive construction of national identity in the worldview narratives, focusing on Ukrainian narrative. And further, I will demonstrate some of the multimodal linguistic instruments that can be used to deconstruct these discursive constructs. So in um, year 2000, as it was already mentioned today, I... Um, was a Fulbright grantee at the University of Mississippi. This is the University of Mississippi uh, with the nickname Ole Miss. And uh, uh, 20 years ago when I was in Mississippi, um, almost nobody uh, of Americans living in Mississippi heard about Ukraine. And even those that heard that there is some kind of country named uh, like that. So they all thought that Ukraine was a part of Russia. So for them, uh, it was a uh, uh, um, revelation to hear that uh, I speak a different language and uh, I come from a different country. And uh, so we even have uh, our, our writers. Uh, so we have our own history and so on and so forth. Um, so at that time, Ukraine was uh, uh, terra incognita for uh, many people around the world. So there was um, no Ukrainian narrative, basically, that um, had been known uh, around the world. So there was always, there always has been a Russian narrative on Ukraine. So that was created, promoted, and internationally. Uh, shared by Russia. So if um, you pay attention to um, the place, the Russian language and uh, the Russian culture um, and uh, the Russian literature takes uh, among other cultures, languages and literatures at many Western universities. So you will probably uh, notice that um, it um, has a dominating position, a very powerful position in academia. So usually uh, the university uh, programs uh, um, in the United States of America and in other European countries are called reasons. You, you've probably heard that. So, and uh, where Russian uh, is uh, the, the, the one of the words uh, that uh, the names of these programs contain. So, and uh, um, it doesn't matter that um, 
all the rest of the cultures, uh, literatures may also be uh, equally important um, and equally powerful. So people in uh, American and Canadian, and I would probably suppose that in some European universities, are not so much interested in all those literatures because Russian is uh, uh, the main word here and all the rest are all together. And uh, even though there are six Polish uh, authors that gained Nobel Prize for literature in the last 10 years, it is still Russian literature that is in favor of Western academia. So Russia has invested uh, a lot of money and effort into creation of a powerful, um, attractive, and even somewhat a romantic image of itself in the world, which uh, now I might say is in the process of being ruined by the creator. So, because uh, um, on February 24, 2022, the world was shaken by the news that Russia attacked a peaceful country and uh, since then has been physically. Uh, destroying Ukrainian cities and uh, killing Ukrainian people. Um, but at the same time, it became clear then, in February 2022, that Ukraine might be probably not a part of Russia. So that, because, because Russia was uh, attacking it, so that um, the sad irony of the situation uh, is that it was the military aggression that happened to take place uh, in the middle of Europe in the 21st century, which revealed Ukraine uh, as the country that was not a part of Russia, that was a separate country, and the country that was bold enough to fight against a very strong enemy. So the biggest country in the world uh, territorially and uh, the second uh, strongest army in the world as uh, they introduced themselves. Uh, and to my mind, uh, one of the main things that happened during the first few months of Russia's uh, war against Ukraine was um, the destruction of um, the myth about Russian power. Uh, the whole world uh, was surprised uh, by the Ukrainian resilience. Um, instead of conquering Ukraine in three days as it was planned, Russia found itself in a long and fierce fight, not just with Ukrainians, uh, but also with the uh, rest of the civilized world, I might say. So, the question is, what is this fight about? Um, I'd like to start answering this question uh, by um, the statement which was um, offered by American writer and political scientist Michael Lind, who said that we live in the era of identity wars. So this statement might seem quite bewildering due, uh, due to its uh, irrevocability. Uh, however, there are plenty of researchers that support this idea. Um, Michael Lind uh, also wrote that while in the 20th century um, all the wars were focused on ideologies, so then in the 21st century all the dominant conflicts, conflicts are identity-driven. And uh, this statement could be the epigraph for this lecture uh, because we will focus on identity construction, identity recognition and unrecognition, and identity preservation in national narratives as a way of a national empowerment. What people uh, know about each other what stereotypes they have about each other's national and ethnic belonging very often is based on um, the narratives that they have been exposed to. And this is just the uh, top of the iceberg. 
As you may see in this picture, Wealdio uh, is in the background of all our actions, so both verbal and nonverbal. So what is our Wealdio? And there are uh, hundreds of different definitions of the notion, so, but basically uh, Wealdio is a comprehensive framework of one's basic beliefs about life, about what is good and what is bad, about what is moral and immoral, about our basic values and ideologies. A worldview can be compared to uh, glasses or lenses uh, through which we look at the world. Depending upon the lens prescription, worldview glasses may make uh, everything blurry or clear or somewhere in between. So if our vision is blurred, our view of the world may be distorted. Consequently, the way we see the world, the way we see ourselves and our place in this world depends upon our worldview or some kind of a program that frames our cognition, our perceptions and interpretations. These programs are built in discursive interaction by means of language in the form of worldview narratives. Containing an irreducible narrative component, worldview narrative constitutes the very matrix of a worldview uh, of a nation, its very essence, content, structure, and implications. So in a worldview narrative, there is uh, some kind of a basic story uh, consisting of multiple sub-stories that provide a way of understanding the way the world around us. And um, I would say that um, we will discuss worldview narrative of Ukrainians, which actually may be applied to any other worldview narratives of uh, any other nation. So in, in four main um, components or elements, worldview narrative, uh, which is created through symbols, uh, through ethos, through memory and vision. Um, so, worldview um, narratives uh, are expressed through uh, plenty of uh, sacred symbols. And these symbols can be events, dates, people, places, things, uh, and so on and so forth. Some of them may be cultural in nature, some may be political, some religious, some personal, etc. So you may see Ukrainian flag, which now is very well known to all Poles. And uh, if, even here in Poznan, I noticed uh, several flags on my way to the university. So though I thought that uh, Ukrainian flags no longer are in Polish, Polish streets, but they still are. And uh, um, so it, uh, coats of arms, uh, uh, stamps, colors, animals, plants, flowers, all different things may be symbolic for us. And February 24, uh, 2022, for instance, will become um, will, will forever be a symbolic um, date for all Ukrainians, uh, maybe not uh, even only Ukrainians. So, and uh, um, uh, folklore, uh, clothes, uh, um, customs, uh, traditions, uh, um, uh, national cuisines, they are all symbolic for us. So you can definitely think of some symbols uh, uh, of your nation. So there can be some places, events, people, and uh, uh, other things that may be symbolic for you. So I uh, wanted to tell you an, um, an anecdote about my personal experience with the symbolic um, toponyms that I had with uh, um, some of uh, uh, Polish people at the beginning of, uh, of this war. So I came to Krakow and uh, I was having a talk and uh, one of the um, listeners came up to me and uh, she said that maybe uh, you shouldn't use uh, the word Volin um, at uh, your presentation because this is the name of my university 
university. So I, I didn't understand. And I asked, why do you think so? And she said, oh, it's not a very pleasant name for a Polish ear. So you probably should have changed it for Lutsk uh, National University. But I said, OK, but this is the, the name of my university. I cannot change it. So this is how names may uh, touch certain chords in our souls and minds and uh, not always pleasant ones. So um, I don't have, I don't think that I have to explain why, um, wh what were the implications of this name for uh, that lady, but uh, th th that was the story. And uh, um, um, <clears throat> usually symbols be those uh, some names or um, objects of reality. So they um, are usually nationally recognizable by all the speakers of the language or uh, representatives of a certain culture. So um, you may see here one of the symbols that um, is recognizable for uh, all, I believe, uh, all Ukrainians. Uh, uh, this is uh, a stamp which was issued by Ukrainian postal or, or, or uh, Ukrainian post, and uh, um, it represents the uh, case when the Ukrainian soldier was retorting. Uh, somewhat crudely um, during the first uh, days of invasion when he was uh, actually um, sending the Russian ship in a very uh, known direction. And uh, um, so uh, the, now these words, uh, so though they are not uh, the words that should be pronounced by uh, a professor at the lecture, so uh, anyway, these words became um, symbolic for all Ukrainians. And whenever there is uh, some, some occasion when uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, troops are um, winning, so we remember those words, and uh, so we have this stamp. So then um, the ethos, the worldview ethos of a culture rooted in a worldview narrative, uh, so um, it denotes the fundamental and distinctive character of a group, uh, the social context or period of time uh, in which this group lives. And uh, it typically is expressed in attitudes, stances, habits, and beliefs. Uh, Germans call um, worldview ethos the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times. So ethos is the uh, animating spirit of a community derived from its overall worldview. It is the collective identity, um, personality, and values of uh, a historical epoch epoch or um, a social group. So um, today we may formulate Ukrainian ethos in one word. So we are uh, fighting basically for freedom. And this is something that amazes many people around the world because uh, lots of people are questioning Ukrainians' resilience. Now, when uh, the world becomes tired of this war, uh, so we hear lots of suggestions uh, that we give up. And uh, so everybody else will become happy. So, But still, Ukraine uh, doesn't have any uh, option. So we don't have uh, um, any way out. We either die or we are fighting for freedom. So, of course, um, nobody wants to fight till the last Ukrainian. Of course, there will be times that then we have to start talking. Uh, but uh, probably this time has not come yet. So, um, if you look at these photographs, you may also find uh, some uh, spirit of uh, modern uh, Ukraine in this in these pictures. Uh, to the left, uh, you will see the photograph of a real uh, Ukrainian professor from Uzhorod University that volunteers to the war, and he is delivering his lecture. 
uh, online from the trenches. So this is a real story and a real person. Uh, fortunately, he is alive and he is back to the university now. So to the right, you see uh, the destroyed uh, kindergarten in one of the eastern cities of Ukraine, where a Ukrainian soldier uh, plays the piano, so in all this rubble. Um, Ukrainian ethos can also be illustrated by um, all those uh, libraries, uh, schools and universities uh, where we all uh, were weaving camouflage nets. So it was uh, a, a very usual thing at the beginning of war. Now we don't have so many of such places, but still there are some spots where people continue weav weaving those camouflage nets that uh, are usually sent to some hot spots of, of uh, military actions. And uh, um, there is... Um, um, such a metaphor that could be applied to uh, Ukrainian resilience, at, at least at the beginning of the war. So we were like bees. So self-organizing, volunteering, and doing whatever we could to help the army and um, our country to not, not, not to fall. So then, well, do you memory refers to a community or a culture's recollection of its history. It's a historical basic story and its response through time to the world you questions it answers. Um, it is essential that um, the memory of the people lives and is created by the people themselves. So, in other words, national histories should be written by the nations themselves, but not by the oppressors, which uh, was the case with Ukraine. For identity to survive, the nation's basic story uh, is to remain uh, vibrant and alive. So there must be a community of people capable of remembering and reinterpreting uh, re um, the memory and this story as um, the times change. Um, in uh, the living story, the people draw strengths for development and progress by remembering its basic story. Uh, memory is created uh, um, in historical books, in historical textbooks. So that is why it is so important what textbooks people use uh, at schools. And uh, that is why it was the first, basically first thing that Russians uh, did uh, in all Ukrainian occupied cities. So they change, changed um, the um, road plates, the names of the cities from Ukrainian into Russian. And uh, they um, changed all the textbooks in schools. Um, memory is also um, something that uh, may be interpreted in a very different way. Um, so, for instance, for Ukrainians, Holodomor or famine of the uh, 1930s is uh, basically the genocide of Ukrainians. And uh, so we now have... Uh, um, Russian speakers population in uh, Russian speaking population in all these eastern cities of Ukraine, uh, not only because of language policies, but also because of Holodomor, because the um, population was uh, basically changed for, for the Russians. And uh, uh, for Russians, uh, this is just um, a regular uh, Hunger, hungry years, regular hungry years, as uh, in any other place of uh, uh, the Soviet Union at those at those times. Um, Ukrainian memory or any other country's memory is also created and uh, uh, stays alive uh, in literature and through literature. And uh, that is why I'm so proud that my university is named after Lesa Ukrainka, who is uh, one of the um, like probably most famous female writers of her times. Uh, she spoke uh, almost eight languages. She was a very well-educated woman, and uh, she still considered herself to be Ukrainian, and she fought 
uh, as much as uh, sh she could uh, for Ukrainian culture, language, and uh, survival, identity survival. Vision is um, derived uh, uh, from the depths of a worldview story, identity narrative. It is inseparably connected to the nation's memory and ethos. So vision is about the future of the country. It has a prescriptive character as it not only describes how things are, but also shows how, how things will be and how things should be. Um, Ukrainian vision, as you probably might know, uh, is inseparably connected to uh, some like democratic world. This is what we uh, are fighting for. We are fighting for our future. We are fighting for our vision, for our uh, togetherness with Europe and uh, with Poland. So, and that is why like, I believe that every Ukrainian, if we have Ukrainian students here in this room, so I'm sure that you will support um, my statement that every Ukrainian is infinitely grateful to uh, Poland and to every uh, Pole for uh, this unimaginable support that you offered to us at the beginning of the war and have been continually offering now. So Ukrainian vision, as you may see, is uh, uh, now even more than before um, is our intention to somehow get away from Russia, get away from our Soviet past. So, but not definitely not for everyone. Um, Ukrainian vision is uh, um, our like future uh, in the civilized world. So, which now is uh, in, the, the existence of which is now in question, I believe. So, this is how what we did for our future. So this um, is the photograph of one of the um, protests um, in Kyiv in uh, 2014. So this is when it all started. This is when Russia annexed Crimea. This is when Russia entered Ukraine uh, in the east. And this is basically when the war started. This is an old war. This is uh, the war that lasts more than nine years already. And uh, so we only started talking about it internationally after full-scale invasion in 2022. Um, all these worldview elements that I have just discussed culminate in a particular way of life, a praxis, a way of being and living in the world. So, um, And worldview entails a way of life and human action. It tells people how they should live, in what they should believe, and what future that should envision. So if you look at this map, you can see how big Russia is. This is a real map, a real size of Russia. And this huge size is reflected in the Russian national narrative, which has always been about its greatness, its special mission and its role in the world. At the same time, without Ukraine um, as its part, Russia uh, somewhat loses its greatness and its ancient history based upon the story ab um, about um, Kievan Rus as uh, the uh, uh, part of Russia's story and about the myth of Ukrainian and Russians being uh, one people. So this can explain the very essence of this war, the war against Ukrainian identity from the Russian side and the war for Ukrainian identity from Ukrainian side. So uh, what is identity? Finally, so the understanding of the term varies according to where and why it is used. In discourse studies, identity is seen as a complex um, phenomenon which can be researched uh, both as an individual issue and uh, as a collective uh, practice. So, um, 
there are various definitions of identity relevant for um, linguistic research, uh, but um, among them I offer to choose the ones that um, treat identity as an ever-changing and fluctuating discursive construct rather than pre-existing and uh, stable entity. And uh, uh, to um, approach this um, unstable and uh, fluent, I would say, construct, um, I would need uh, the um, methodology and a term that would best suit the view of identity as uh, uh, an unstable entity. So this concept um, could be the concept of bricolage introduced by the famous social anthropologist uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss um, that uh, offers very interesting perspectives on how identity uh, is negotiated through language. Lévi-Strauss draws on Saussure's understanding of the linguistic sign when he explains how the mind of a bricolet um, operates. So bricolet, the person who actually constructs or deconstructs signs. Signs, um, according to this theory, function as a link between images, concepts, and reality. Um, the sign or each bricolage element functions as a mediator between a perceptible world on the one hand and the interpretation of this world on the other hand. An important part um, of the bricolage, bricolage constructing process concerns the setting up of a dialogue with the tools and materials at uh, the bricolet's disposal. Is the bricolet um, familiar with the signs? Are they indexing anything to him or her? So are they indexing any features? So, or uh, in other words, are they interpretable? So the bricolage functions very much as a metaphor for discursive reconstruction of identity creation where any sign, be it a verbal sign or nonverbal, can be seen as a, um, some kind of bricks used for construction. And now I'd like to start the uh, deconstruction of Ukrainian identity by in, uh, looking at pictorial images profusely used uh, in present-day media to create the identity under study. So framing of the Ukrainian-Russian conflict through non-verbal signs of different nature um, can be very potential in uh, this kind of work, deconstructive work of Ukrainian identity. Among multiple illustrations of Ukraine deployed by the modern Ukrainian media, female images are the most popular uh, in metaphorizing Ukrainian identity. Usually, uh, this Ukraine as a woman construal is represented through the image of young, beautiful, um, courageous woman. So very often she, uh, she may not only be young and tender and uh, beautiful, but she can also be rebellious and uh, independent. So we may find some female images not only in... Uh, pictures, but also in um, sculptures, monuments, and even murals, as you may see here. This is a real picture from France. So in the Russian um, discursive tradition, Ukraine is represented um, uh, in a very different way. So in this picture, you may see um, a monument which was erected in Belgorod, which is a, a city very close to Ukrainian border in Russia uh, at the beginning of the war. And uh, this is the monument to a Ukrainian woman um, seeing in the Russian soldiers. Uh, with the Soviet flag in her hand. And you may see that this is a very different image of a woman. Uh, she is old, she is uh, um, um, seemingly poor, right? And uh, uh, she is happy that Russian soldiers came to Ukraine because uh, she uh, 
uh, thinks of herself as uh, an inseparable part of Russia and Soviet Union, which is the reflection of the Russian narrative of uh, a non-existent Ukrainian identity as it is portrayed in the Russian media. Female images representing Ukrainian identity um, are deployed not only in social networks media, but also in modern Ukrainian literature and song lyrics. For instance, the popular song released uh, in uh, 2018 by um, the popular Ukrainian group um, depicts Ukraine um, as Mala, a little girl. Uh, sweetheart, with, or, which often is the way young Ukrainian men address their beloved girlfriends. Добрий ранок, Україно, прокидайся вже мала, я несу тобі єдина чашку кави і молока, and so on. So get up, my little girl, uh, so I'm getting a cup of coffee and milk for you, my only one. Such an unusual animated or pers personified treating of the country could be interpreted in different ways, but one of the main underlying implications is that uh, the addressee sees his motherland as someone worth loving and taking care of. Um, identities are not just framed in discourse and by discourse, but they are also reframed and re-semanticized. Um, as an example of such reframing of an uh, identity image, I can offer a photograph of a young woman breastfeeding her newly born baby in a Kyiv metro station uh, where she was hiding from the Russian bombs in early March 2022. This uh, photograph of a random woman was shared on multiple internet platforms and became viral, having got the global attention and popularity. As a symbol of motherhood and sufferings, this image not only became an icon of a Ukrainian woman uh, and in the semiotic sense, but later it was used as a religious icon, representing Saint Madonna in one of the Catholic churches near Naples, Italy. So an image of a regular woman uh, that was feeding her baby under irregular circumstances of undeclared war was transformed into the image of a holy mother gaining some features of metaphysical fortitude and absolute pos uh, positivity of a saint. This is a real photograph from that place, from that church near Naples. So another case of social semiosis during wartime could be illustrated by the photo shoot of Ukrainian First Lady Olena Zelenska, produced by famous American photographer Ani Leibovitz for Vogue magazine. Entitled Portrait of Bravery, this photo narrative became an iconic symbol of Ukraine and was used not only as an um, emblematic simulacrum of national resilience and heroism, but also as an instrument for popularization of Ukrainian identity in the world. Having powerful ethical, feminist, and political implications, it caused strong resonance in Ukrainian society and abroad, including hot discussions of its somewhat controversial aesthetics. Um, Unfortunately, I have only five minutes, and so I will be very short now. So not less emblematic are uh, the textual properties of the political rhetoric on the war Russia launched um, in Ukraine. Um, so uh, I would like to very shortly show you uh, the results of the analysis of uh, uh, Russian and Ukrainian media where war was the object of stance taking and uh, uh, two countries were seen as collective stance takers. So um, Ukraine, for instance, in this stance taking triangle um, uh, speaks about a war as a Russian aggression against Ukraine, a source of grief, a fight for freedom, a necessity to defend Ukraine and Ukrainian identity. While um, in the Russian stance,
uh, triangle, um, Russian, uh, Russia uh, calls Ukraine as a um, Nazi state, um, Ukrainian Nazis, okay, so I lost, um, mm -hmm. uh, non-existent state, anti-Russia, and so on and so forth. And we also know that um, uh, Russia, uh, up till now doesn't call, doesn't name uh, this war a war, but it still is naming uh, this uh, terrible aggression as an uh, operation, some kind of operation. So philosopher uh, Charles Taylor argues that identity is shaped by recognition um, or its absence, or absence of this recognition. In other words, the way in which an individual um, is or is not acknowledged. And Russia refuses to recognize Ukraine as a nation, which only strengthens uh, all the self-identification processes. Uh, in his essay published in uh, 2021, Vladimir Putin, the president of the Russian Federation, mentioned that Ukraine never truly existed, existed as a country and uh, that the territories of Ukraine are basically the Russian lands. Um, and Russian offici uh, uh, Russians officially deny Ukrainians the right for their ethnic and national self-identification as an independent people with their own history, culture, and language. This denial made the sense of Ukrainian identity to take on a greater intensity in the past two years. Russian aggression consolidated all Ukrainians, Ukrainian people, including those who might earlier have not had any sense of national identity at all, or even have felt closer to Russian culture and Russia's information space. Russian invasion um, accelerated the process of de-Russification, de-Sovietization, and as a result of Ukrainization. In this picture, you see one of the memes that was released not so long ago. So you may see the photo, the picture of Dostoevsky here, who is uh, um, the picture of the Russian literature and uh, is one of the must read uh, authors around the world so uh, <laughs> this is Tolstoy this is uh, how Ukrainians uh, um, uh, oppose against the Russian um, invasion even uh, culturally and linguistically so when Russian Russians shell uh, residential buildings and destroy cities and villages in eastern Ukraine, every shot diminishes the number of those who have sympathy with Russia. People might speak Russian, but they feel strong Ukrainian identity now. Russia, to my mind, has lost the battle for their hearts and minds. Thank you very much for your attention.